think about it. Deep conversations with Uli Bear on big ideas and great books. Welcome, and I'm really excited to welcome Professor Raphael Walker today. Thank you so much, Raphael, for joining me on Think About It. It's my pleasure. I couldn't think of anywhere else I'd rather be. <laughs> so um, before we start, uh, and I'll introduce you for a moment here, I just want to point out to our listeners as well that you can find us on YouTube, on Instagram. Uh, I'm uli.bear on Instagram. You are at raf uh, underscore walk at, on Twitter, right? So people can find us. We'll post this episode. I think it's important, and this will be posted on all the platforms. Um, Spotify, iTunes, uh, podcast apps, YouTube, etc. Um, Raphael, you uh, you teach at Baruch College in New York City, and you earned your PhD at the University of Pennsylvania and your ma uh, your bachelor's degree at Washington University in St. Louis, which connects you to Kate Chopin, yeah. a writer whose novel *The Awakening* and whose short stories we want to talk about. Tell me a little bit how you got interested in this turn of the century, sort of late 1900s American fiction and why this novel uh, moves you so much. So, but maybe we'll start with your connection to Chopin as a writer, um, you can do that. Yeah, yeah, uh, great question. Um, you know, Chopin is interestingly at the beginning um, of my sort of the history of my connection with American literature. Um, I was 17 uh, when I first read uh, Kate Chopin's The Awakening. I think it was junior year of high school. And at that point in my life, I actually wasn't very much of a reader, believe it or not. Here I am, a professor of English saying that, but it's true. I wanted to be a scientist. Um, but, uh, you know, I read that novel and, you know, it and really one other, and it's Wuthering Heights, um, have made me think, okay, well, which is actually kind of great. And, you know, I couldn't really, I didn't have the language to explain why this, uh, you know, turn of the 20th century novel about a discontented uh, married, woman, uh, married woman from the South spoke to me, this 17 year old little black boy in Texas. You know, um, it didn't, um, it, it seemed to me kind of like this otherworldly kind of thing, but uh, so it was, um, I, I was drawn to that novel year after year after year. Um, I ended up reading it even further when I got to, to college. Um, and, you know, it was through writing on that, uh, it, probably my sophomore year of college, um, that, you know, I decided to switch majors. I you know, said, well, actually, I, can, I should become an English major. Uh, and it was just, uh, you know, from then on, it just stayed with me. I, uh, the first chapter of my honors thesis was on it first chapter of my dissertation, the first um, real thing that I actually published in the world was on Kate Chopin. So, you know, it is, um, it, it's been really, um, uh, you know, you have those books that you return to at least once a year, no matter how many times you read them. It's always a pleasure and you find something new and it's hard to believe it. I've probably read and taught that novel some dozen times or so over the last 15 years, uh, but it's still- um, Stay right there. Wait, I want to connect to this in a moment. So this novel, The Awakening, published 89, turns you into a reader. And as you know better than I do, Kate Chopin sort of influenced by different people, Guy de Maupassant, big influence. She actually wrote books and wanted to write literature that isn't about literature, isn't about reading books, but is about life. So in an interesting way, it shifted you in your life's trajectory from majoring in science to then studying literature and now writing about it. And the reason why, you're, why I wanted to talk to you because you wrote this amazing essay about um, the awakening. So, but the book is really a book about somebody who's turning away from intellectualizing and overthinking, right? From someone who's, this is, this, it's a short novel and I just reread it twice over the weekend and it's short enough that you can reread it, but you kind of feel, you, I, you feel sort of um, both exhilarated and exhausted afterwards, like exhausted, like this is so yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. There's so much. Yeah, no, I, I think that you're, you're right. Um, um, one of the things that I think makes it seem um, that it's maybe less um, uh, cerebral, if you will, than a lot of other books is that, um, it's so bodily. I mean, there is just so much corporeal 
stuff in there in ways that you're not used to seeing um, in uh, at least Anglo-American novels in the 19th century, especially with respect to a woman. You've got a heroine there. Um, and, you know, every other page you're talking about, you, you've got some sensuous passage that is really, really embodying her. I mean, that was just extremely uh, unusual. So, I mean, I, I get very readily how um, just the omnipresence of the body in the book can lead one to believe that it's not heady. But, you know, it is, too, because we know and we'll talk about the protagonist soon. Um, she is you will introduce us to her to introduce us to our protagonist you know, who's, who I really think yeah you can help me with this she's really one of the major figures in literature she is right. like Emma Bovary Anna Karenina all these women who are sort of for us really alive but introduce us to this heroine of the awakening yeah yeah you know um oddly enough uh, given her French connection, Japan's French connection, I mean, it's, I, I easily see how we'd want to go there. I mean, I see her um, kind of even more in line with someone like Elizabeth Bennett from Pride and Prejudice, but we can talk about that uh, later. Yeah. Um, so this is a uh, 27, 28 year old uh, woman uh, from, she's raised in Kentucky, Presbyterian background, and marries into, uh, this super French Creole society in Louisiana, right? She is in so many ways an outsider that is marked at every turn. She hardly speaks French. Uh, they, uh, most people are, are, are courteous enough not to speak French in front of her. Uh, some people aren't, but she's, she doesn't even have that much. And that's kind of uh, almost a baseline entrance uh, for that. For that society. Uh, she's married to a um, uh, guy who's a little older than her, not, not too much, um, uh, Léonce uh, Pontellier, who is uh, a businessman, highly, highly conventional uh, in terms of Creole ways. Uh, he's constantly reminding her that she's somehow coloring outside of the lines and trying to get her back into those. Um, and, you know, she is she finds herself at odds uh, for a number of reasons with the other women whom she, you know, uh, kind of, uh, she never actually calls them that, but uh, the narrator's kind of in her head, kind of free and direct discourse. She's not a mother woman in the way that these other women are. Uh, it's not that she doesn't love her kids, it's just that she wasn't cut out for motherhood, as she uh, herself admits uh, at some point. I mean, it's one of those things even now moms are scared to say, right, that uh, maybe I didn't want to be a mom. So you can imagine just uh, what a taboo utterance that would have been uh, even then, she, you know, at times shrinks away uh, from, from, that, from that thought. But it's just very clear, even though she loves her children, she's not really um, prepared to, especially as her awakening intensifies, uh, to give up herself uh, for her for her children to be a motherhood. And that's what it was expected that mother woman would do. So she's living in uh, New Orleans at this time. And as you yeah. said, she's married to a man. He's not a terrible man at all. He's, he's nice, actually. He's actually solicitous. And sometimes when she doesn't want to do something, he says, well, you're kind of expected to do this. And then he sort of just, he actually doesn't berate her. He doesn't put his foot down as one of the neighbors recommends. So he seems kind of nice. The children seem rather charming and harmless. They're not little, you know, devils. Uh, yeah. So th she's very privileged. Uh, she is pretty well off. So what is her discontent? And this is, an, it, for me, this is an interesting kind of question, sort of where does it come from? And I think when the book was written, Kate Chopin also was pretty successful. She was writing lots of short stories. Um, she had lost her husband, but she was doing well. So in some ways there's something, what is the source of this novel actually be, or like, what does it come out of? I, that, that's a great observation. And it's one of the things that uh, then as now uh, perplexes a lot of readers about this book. I mean, her husband is all things indulgent. You, you know, you can, especially to 21st century eyes, I mean, you know, you can see the, um, 
kind of objectifying way. I mean, it opens up with him eyeing her as if she were property, right? We, we readily see uh, what's wrong with that. But really by 19th century standards, this is a good husband. Um, he provides for the family, um, even when uh, you know he thinks she should be doing something and she doesn't want to, he doesn't push. It's actually um, her father who, when, uh, on his visit to the family, says, you know, hey man, you've got to put your foot down. The way to okay. man the wife is via coercion and something else. And then the narrator, always funny, really just, um, you can tell Chopin's sense of humor through this narrator. Uh, there's an aside after he uh, insists on that for Leontz, it says, little did he know that uh, it was probably too much coercion that led uh, his own wife to an early grave. Because uh, of course, uh, her mom's dead at this point. Uh, but, you know, nobody really gets what's so wrong with her. And I think part of the reason for her that, you know, you, you probably noticed in reading it that there is this atmosphere of confusion, uh, right? She does not know. She does not have the language uh, to describe her, her discontent. And well, that's because there really hadn't been language to describe women, especially mothers, who wanted, you know, not, little more than the prerogatives that are readily afforded to men uh, in their lives. And that's, you know, simply um, this uh, wish to kind of live a life in accordance with um, of her own, uh, of her own making. I mean, it's what's classically called autonomy, right? In the Enlightenment tradition, right? Mm -hmm. to, to live according to laws that are of her own making. Um, and to kind of escape enmeshment in relation. Um, you know, she says, I only want to be left alone. You know, that's, that seems like a pretty simple wish, but uh, it gets her in all kinds of trouble. Um, you you yeah. point this out um, in your discussion. She, at one moment, she sits in her house after she goes away for this summer break, and then she's reading Emerson. Yeah. It, it just sits in the novel there. So, and I assume at this point, it, it's the 1890s. So it's not the Emerson we know today. It's sort of the Emerson that is taken up there. So probably self-reliance in a pretty straightforward way, meaning, which is not quite probably what it means, relying on yourself. I had another podcast with Eduardo Cadava, who said, no, 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 no. Self-reliance is not selfishness. <laughs> self-reliance is not autonomy. But here you're saying she's sort of, in a world where women are very restricted and restrained and, and confined to these roles, and she wants something more, but she doesn't quite maybe want what men have, right? Like she just doesn't keep, even know what she wants when the book starts. She just wants something, right? The book doesn't start out saying, I don't want this anymore, I want this other life. Yeah, so you know what really triggers um, this awakening for her is the sensuality of this new culture. I mean, look, she's coming from Kentucky, Protestant tradition, you know, it is um, kind of infamously, um, uh, let us say, phobic about the body, right? Um, and, you know, that just wasn't something she was accustomed to. I mean, the heady stuff, yes, right? That's something we, we uh, associate with um, the Protestant tradition, but the sensuality um, that she finds there, and that is just intensified during the um, summer trip that we uh, begin the novel with, which is on Grand Isle, this um, island uh, community. Um, it acquaints her with her body like nothing else before. You may remember that it was the um, swim that really is a turning point in this respect. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she had never really been able to swim. Um, they had been working with her on it. Uh, but, you know, it hadn't really taken. But one night after a party, uh, and, and this is a party, um, importantly, where she's just listened to uh, Mademoiselle Rees, this kind of spinster artist figure, um, uh, play um, a, a, a piece by Chopin, no relation, right, the, the, the composer. Um, and she stirred. Um, and then she goes out for the swim. Yeah. And you know, there's something about swimming we have to to keep in mind here. It's you know, there's no other experience that kind of involves our entire bodies uh, in coordination at the same time, like swimming. So, in a certain respect, it's kind of the uh, perfect 
activity or emblem um, to uh, mark this moment of her getting acquainted with her body. Um, and there's this coordination, not only among body parts, but between body and mind. Right? There is this suturing that's happening uh, between these two parts of the self, especially for women, that had been thought uh, so long apart in the Western tradition. They're coming together for her. And give me the, you gave me a quote uh, in advance of this um, podcast. Can you can, let's look at this quote about um, the ocean or the sea, which becomes so important in the both, as you're saying, in kind of the symbolism and the sort of development, and then also at the end of the novel, of course. But this quote, if you the quote you just sent me, we can talk about that for a moment. If you can uh, give our listeners this, it's quite a beautiful and a little bit of a haunting quote. <laughs> Yes, let me let me just track it down here. It is like so much of the novel, extremely haunting and uh, oracular in certain ways, right? Um, well, and I I want to say to our listeners what Kate Chopin can do in three sentences. And in these sort of short chapters, a lot of other novels do in three volumes in the 19th century, because the big, the big British novel usually is sort of a three volume novel. And so she's very economical in doing this. That's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, I think I, I'll just get it here uh, got it on my computer. Yeah, it, it's just and it's just a quick sentence, but mm -hmm. uh, it is. Uh, for a number of reasons, I think, uh, important and representative. So uh, it's near the end, uh, you know, just before uh, she goes for a um, uh, more, shall we say, impactful swim. Um, uh, the narrator tells us that the voice of the sea is seductive, never ceasing, whispering, clamoring, murmuring, inviting the soul to wander in abysses of solitude. Now, um, there are a number of reasons I think that is an important uh, quotation. Um, it reminds us, I think, pretty heartily that with Chopin, you must attend to the language. I mean, it is simply poetic. So your know, line like that, we see how deliberate it is when we just look at all of the S sounds in it. I was trying to emphasize that as I was reading it. Um, that sibilance is not at all um, accidental there. I mean, and it becomes quite apparent when you see her use a word like abysses, which has you know, so many S's that, you know, she's almost hitting you over the head with it. Um, but it is really conjuring this atmosphere. So, you know, we're kind of invited bodily to engage with this story. Um, yeah. It conjures feelings of, you know, what thing says over again, a serpent, right? And not accidentally in a novel this short, there are three different references to serpents uh, who don't really have a natural fit in a domestic book like this, right? Um, I think when she and uh, Robert or Robert, they want to go for an afternoon and watch the little slithering gold snakes and this yep. abandoned fort. And then she mentions it even again. She sort of, it's a fantasy for the two of them to escape for an afternoon and watch these little slithering sl lizards like snakes. It's very, right. it's very strange. It is like a reference. And then you think, this is what they want to do. And then, Absolutely. And, then and, and she also uses it twice in reference to the sea. She talks about, uh, you know, the foam kind of curling up like golden serpent. Well, you know, the, the serpent is, as long as we can remember, associated with being seduced by something that's harmful, right? We go all the way back to Eden uh, and think about, uh, you know, that the tree of knowledge that uh, the serpent is actually Satan tips man uh, into sampling. Um, and it's the tree of knowledge that, you know, teaches him, uh, you know, about uh, that he's naked in the first place. You know, you could argue about sexuality in the first place. Um, but it is, it's, it's kind of like being really, really seduced into something that is poisonous, 
that is dangerous. I, and Chopin's very aware of that, right? She tells us, but the beginning of things, of a world especially, is always chaotic, how many people perish uh, in a swag. I'm botching the quote, but that's really the gist of it. Um, so, you know, that it, it's really through the language there that she not only says it, but in accent, right? The language is being co-opted um, into this um, uh, this uh, message that she's sending to us about, you know, how for this protagonist, the kind of journey that she's going on that would be spiritual and great for just about any other protagonist in literature, particularly a man, is actually perilous to her, so much so that it occasions, uh, as we know, her death at the end. Let's stay with this. This kind of interesting, I, in a way, when you just said about the serpent. So there's the sea is whispering, clamoring, murmuring, inviting, which is the image of Eve seducing and sort of whispering in his ear, Adam, get the apple, get the apple. It's always the woman's voice who is actually corrupting this paradise where everything was ordered because the voice of God was the one. And then e Eve says to him, pick the apple or the serpent says pick the apple mm -hmm. but what you just said the ocean in and i'm just doing a cursory look at but in moby dick the great american novel 19th century it's perilous it's dangerous it's not the promise of a kind of liquid abandoned to yourself it's something else you have maybe the ancient mariner and coleridge something out of england but here i wonder whether people were really sort of so outraged and troubled by this book by the last part of the sentence inviting the soul to wander in abysses of solitude. For a woman to have this feeling that you could let yourself go and be yourself, it really triggered a lot of critics at the time, right? It really, really troubled them what is being promised here. Yes, yes, absolutely. And we, we should talk about uh, the, the reception because, you know, it, it did trouble people. Um, but I, I think there's been a lot of, um, I, I think people, critics mainly have misunderstood what was so troubling or actually the nature of their response to it. But um, I wanna say um, something else about uh, that moment that you mentioned. Um, really her closest uh, predecessor, precursor to my mind in a sentence like that with all of the um, participles that you get there, the ing, ing, that's of course Walt Whitman, right? Uh, who was the poet of the body, right? Um, the one who would not, um, you know, uh, put the put the soul or ethereal matters at a um, uh, somehow in um, to subordination to the body. They were for him parallel, just as they were for Kate Chopin here. Um, and that sensuality that you see, very. And she was a reader of Whitman. We know that. I mean, in her short story, A Respectable Woman, she quotes Song of Myself. Yeah. Right? Yeah, right. Um, so, you know, we, we, we know very well she read him and she read him uh, with great admiration. Well, let um, me ask you, this is probably my ignorance of Whitman, but there's a sense in which Whitman has this sensuality, sort of he loves all of America, it's like filled with all this kind of sensual love. And then um, there's also a part of Whitman where and I'm kind of still amused at biographers who still cannot quite settle on Whitman's own sexuality because we must have actually been in the bedroom when he was there. Worse, Emerson, Thoreau, everybody else, we know their sexuality, but Whitman, we don't quite know. So there's, let's say an avoidance. So here we have a woman protagonist and a woman writer, two separate things, who is actually, what you're saying, exploring this feeling of sensual, feeling herself elevated through this feeling of being herself in, in, while swimming. So something else happened for Whitman. And I think Whitman, people channeled this for a long time, the sensuality into comradeship. And there's a kind of communion, a political union of the country, all of that. So some way they sublimated over and over again. Mm -hmm. Whitman doesn't sublimate so well, as you're saying, he just keeps on going. But Kate Chopin, it's not sublimated here. What this feeling that she has is this, about the ocean, what happens to our protagonist? She goes, learns how to swim in the summer vacation, right? And then she goes back to the city and you're supposed to forget what happens in the summer. It's a summer, <laughs> like that's actually, yeah. I think the book is also about that. There's an interlude and a lot of people in the book sort of say, let her be herself for a few weeks. 
send her back to her family or you go away to the husband. Sort of, she'll get over it. It's a phase, but it's not a phase for her. Mm -hmm. right? Something happened. There's another quote. Uh, maybe we can start, we can look at this quote where the husband is looking at her and the quote is starting saying he could see plainly that she was not herself. That is, he could not see that she was becoming herself and daily casting aside that fictitious self, which we assume like a garment with which to appear before the world. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in this summer experience, she has, an, she has an experience of herself and then it leads to a process that's gonna be sort of the whole, the end of the undoing of her in the book, right? Yeah, and which, which is ultimately, uh, you know, the great tragedy of it, because, you know, it shouldn't have been, right? It shouldn't have been. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yes, you know, they are, this is a world of surfaces. Um, and it is, um, you know, it's hard to think about uh, that quotation or this line of conversation without thinking about the distinction she is, uh, you know, very haltingly uh, attempting to draw between herself and, or the unessential and the essential, uh, right? And maybe we can read that in concert just so we have it um, uh, in front of us here. Uh, would you like to read it or would you like me to read it? You should read it, you're the, you're the expert, I'm just listening. And I wanna go back to one thing you said, it shouldn't have ended this way. I'm kind of really interested when you said, but let's go to this quote, I would give up. All right. Um, I would give up the unessential, she says, and there, at this moment, she's sitting um, in a room uh, knitting and chatting with uh, the other mother women on Grand Isle. Uh, I would give up the unessential. I would give up my money. I would give up my life for my children. But I wouldn't give myself. I can't make it more clear. It's only something I am beginning to comprehend, which is revealing itself to me, right? So uh, again, there we see uh, kind of the halting quality of her attempts to explain what's going on in her. Um, and it really, it's a big thing. I mean, her, her she's um, coming to a sense of herself that has, that's completely at odds with what her world has told her she ought to be, right? What the options available uh, to her are. But um, this is a world held together by what uh, her husband calls les convenances, the conventions, right? This is who we are, this is how we act, this is what holds us all together. Um, and women selves are understood as part of that. There is no self outside of your role as mother, wife, that's it. And this is why when she's uttering these things, they sound like sheer nonsense to Madame Rottignol, right? She says, I'm sure you could do no more than give up your life for your children. What are you talking about, right? And she's struggling to articulate this aspect of self that exceeds one's role within uh, both uh, sort of um, human to social relations and biological relations. There's more than that. There's this metaphysical self that's beyond um, and that's sacred and that Emerson um, would have recognized. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, he becomes such an important figure uh, in this novel. In other words, I don't think that uh, Chopin understands him as, you know, uh, this rugged individualism or anything so mm -hmm. crude, but just this um, commitment to, uh, you know, yourself developing laws that you understand rather than, uh, you know, having everything already cooked for you and delivered uh, in terms of thought, right? Uh, kind of making deliberate choices about how you want to be in the world. That's what she's talking about when she says the unessential, right? The, the sacrosanct that composes uh, all of us. So I'm really trying to, I'm listening to you and I'm trying not to filter my way to respond to this sentence, which is so complicated to me. It's only beginning, it's only something I'm beginning to comprehend, which is revealing itself to me. And this self, I read with my really kind of inadequate knowledge of what happens in the 20th century of feminism. There's Simone de Beauvoir 50 years later to the day who says, woman is not born, but made. She's all conventions and there's, Freud 25 years afterwards says, 
women, what women want is something we cannot know as a male psychoanalyst. He said, what does woman want? The guiding question of most of Freud is actually, we don't know what female desire is. Then you have, and I'm skipping forward, I'm gonna leave this whole trajectory after that. People in the 1980s or 90s saying everything is performative. There is no self, there is no core. We all just perform these roles all the time. So when you're saying her metaphysical self, I'm hearing it's not quite answered by saying, oh, it's her sexuality. Oh, it's her desire. You're saying there's something else, but I think the book sometimes is read like that. And there's a couple of short stories. The Storm, which is an amazing story, which wasn't printed as you pointed out until the 1960s by her Norwegian kind of rediscoverer. But The Storm is a really, really erotic story, uh, right? Incredibly erotic. And that wasn't printed in her lifetime. But sexuality isn't the answer to Edna's quest here, right? You're saying it's the self in another way. And then she... So can we just go through the sort of second part of the book when she's back in New Orleans, her husband goes to New York to make some more money, the kids are swept away with the mother-in-law and she has time to herself and what does she do? Yeah, um, the uh, sex in this book and throughout most of Japan's writing, I, you know, I, I think it's largely because it was so new, you know, women didn't write like that uh, generally and <laughs> certainly didn't write about uh, other women in that way. But there is so much more. I think it is just hyper legible in the book because that is so new. But we have to remember, Edna wants to be an artist too. She also wants to have her own property, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the erotic and love period. You know, this is not a love story. Mm. Uh, even in, you know, recent, recent um, mm -hmm. editions uh, of the book, people focus over much on Robert LeBron's role in this, even though really he just sort of bookends things. Um, and the novel, the narrator is kind of at every opportunity undercutting him. From the start, we're told um, he smoked cigarettes because he couldn't afford cigars. That seems like a throwaway, but nothing is throwaway in Japan. She's <laughs> feminizing him, right? Um, <laughs> You know, and, and other things happen too. We're told in that same passage, and this is at the very beginning, that, oh, you know, he and his, he and his um, comrade or companion talking about Edna, they bore a resemblance with his face shaven. That resemblance was even closer, right? So, I mean, it is, we're told he has a trill voice later on. The book really is trying to deflate him. Um, and she even says, Edna at the end, she realizes as she's going into the ocean, that I think the quote is something like, the thought of even him would soon fade, she recognized. He really was just kind of this uh, vehicle that kind of helped her see her way out of the conventions, but he's really not the focus of it. It's not really a love story. It's only in the moments where she goes to uh, visit Mademoiselle Rees, um, and she's playing the piano for her, that he comes to mind in large measure because it puts her in mind of uh, the first moment when she started to feel these emancipatory feelings that in the first place put her on this collision course with her society's norms. But he's really not, he's not the focus. Even a story like the storm that you brought up that is so, I mean, it's almost pornographic by, uh, you know, 19th century standards in how sexual it is. Well, what that story is trying to show is simply that, you know, people sometimes have sex outside of marriage. And yet the storm came, but it passed too. And everything went back to normal. Nobody died, right? <laughs> Either socially or actually. It is a certain... It's, it's almost trying to match, and this was, there's nothing more American than this, trying to match the human morality, trying to put it more in line with nature's yeah. morality, yeah. so things almost become amoral, not immoral, amoral, right? Well, uh, Raphael, I like the fact that you actually called poor Robert Craven at some point. I kind of liked Robert for a while. I was kind of on his side because I actually misread the book for a while, which probably a lot of people would, I guess, and sort of say, oh, he's leading her out of this kind of 
the doldrums of her married life. And then as you're saying, he, it's not about him, it is about her. And he becomes maybe someone she meets her, but it's not him. I, 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 we could go on a lot, it's a short novel. There's a huge amount, it opens up this question and you recommended that I would read um, the Silk Stockings, Two Silk Stockings story, which is a gorgeous, tiny story, which all of our readers can probably read while, while they're listening. It's just an amazing, can you tell us a little bit about this story? which is also, in, which is a, it's, it's, just a, it's just an incredible story that I think could be published today and should be published today again. I think so too. And you know, that one um, has 10, I, I teach that story um, and it fares a bit better uh, with my undergraduates than uh, The Awakening is. I mean, I, I don't know if you know about this, just kind of by the by, um, uh, Emily Toth, who's uh, Emily, who is um, Kate Chopin's, most recent biographer. I think she's written two biographies uh, of, of Kate Chopin, and, uh, really, really a, an important Chopin scholar. She wrote this essay in this, uh, the, the volume in which that essay of mine you read was published in called The I Hate Edna Club. Mm -hmm. and, and they're referring to uh, the fact that, you know, teaching the awakening can often be uh, a little difficult because for just the reasons you were saying earlier, um, a lot of people don't understand what's wrong with her. Uh, and she, she seems so well kept and... and um, what's wrong with her? Like, before we go to the silk stocking, one other question we, we touched on and you write about this. She's so privileged. Mm -hmm. She has so many servants and people have faulted her for not feeling, oh, my liberation has to include everybody's liberation. There's quadroons and mulattoes and black boys serving all over the place in this book, but somehow it never extends to them that maybe they feel. And I just wanted to sort of register for our readers. It's a book set in 1899. I think Kate Chopin totally knows what she's doing, but she doesn't give us an answer that would satisfy maybe our wish that Feminism should include all sorts of liberations, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's just to me a very, very, very big ask for a book out of the 1890s. I mean, Chopin was already doing quite enough as it is, and I think she was um, completely aware um, of the privilege uh, status of of her protagonist and her tendency toward exploitation, right? She goes, when, when she and Robert have her, their, their day out in the, um, uh, kind of far out on the, the, the island, um, she goes and just shows up to this woman's house and just lies in the bed. Uh, right. and, and, and has everyone just kind of wait on her. This is not even her own home, mind you. Uh, the woman's not a servant. This is her very own home. Um, and just, yeah, I don't think she even thanks the woman. Uh, at, at any point. So, I mean, Chopin wrote this, right? She's the one who enables us to see these, these blind spots. So I, I think she was aware um, that, you know, uh, yes, uh, Edna's awakening is predicated on the exploited labors of all of these other people, which is bad. I mean, you look at some of Chopin's other stories and yes, yeah, she was obtuse in a lot of, pe in, in, a, in a way that a lot of people were about uh, racial stereotypes and so forth. You get those and, you know, to, to readers today, you look and you say, oh, well, that's kind of darkies. What are we using that word? Um, but uh, she was, you know, not, um, not at all blind to some of the injustices, uh, racially as well as uh, gender-based. Um, so let's but, go to Mrs. Summers. Summers, her name, and a pair of silk stockings, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> Another wife, right? And we, we do want to kind of underscore here too, just how unconventional that was. I mean, it's coming more into fashion and would ha occur um, with increasing frequency in American literature on, but we have to realize in the 19th century, um, wives weren't usually protagonists, not in novels, because the idea was um, once you're married, you don't want anything else. All desire thought to uh, dissipate at that period in life. So, you know, the interesting uh, portion of a woman's life was the period where she had some choice and things were variable. And that was courtship for the most part. But so, you know, the tendency to write about wives and discontented wives uh, at that 
was also uh, mm -hmm. something that was um, really innovative uh, in Chopin's fiction. But yes, we've got Mrs. Summers, who's this, um, uh, she's this mother. All things conventional at first, we're told that she was so uh, self-effacing and so uh, you know selfless when it came to managing her household that uh, she would sometimes, in ministering to her family's needs, forget herself even to eat. Right? I mean, this is the kind of person that she is. So she gets windfall. We don't know where it came from. Of fifteen dollars, um, and so you know she goes to the store and she's going to buy stuff uh, for her children for the most part. Uh, and the only affordance she's going to give herself are things that are going to make her a more efficient wife. So, I mean, it's not like she was going out to get a pearl necklace or earrings, like she was going to get, like, you know, cleaning stuff. Um, and, you know, she gets to the store and, you know, the late 19th century marketplace, I mean, they're, they're getting good at uh, enticing the customer in, right? Um, and that that's what's happening there. They've got all of these beautiful things on display, these, these stockings, which are kind of the gateway into what happens uh, over the course of the story. Um, much like uh, Edna, it's this, it's this richly sensuous experience that moves her to the other side of things. So she feels these stockings, they too are compared to serpents. So we've got that yet again, right? This um, kind of emblem of, of seduction, of, 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 um, um, of, of desire being kind of wedded here. Um, and from then on, I mean, she just becomes this completely whole other person uh, once she uh, gets this intensely uh, sensuous seduction of the marketplace, right? She's walking through um, and touching and feeling and smelling. And for the first time, it, it becomes apparent to us, she's actually being acquainted with self-indulgence. She just had never, you know, you get the sense that she had never even entertained that as a possibility mm -hmm. for her. But, you know, it becomes a, a slippery slope, right? She's she goes from being completely selfless to entirely selfish. And that was that was something that occupied uh, Chopin just across uh, her fiction, uh, this this way that, you know, um, after the if you open the bottle, the genie's out and there's really no going back. Right. Uh, just over the course of this short story, something that is dilated upon and slowed down a bit uh, in the awakening, uh, we see um, a woman uh, go from perfectly 19th century, uh, stereotypically speaking, uh, to something other. And this is, you know, Chopin's way of, I think, um, kind of allegorizing for us, and she loved a good allegory, uh, the way that women's becoming acquainted with desire had this really transformative power mm -hmm. of taking them from their Victorian mothers mm -hmm. into something completely new. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was on the vanguard, really, of thinking it, about that in the American context. Such a wonderful little story. So it's 1896, the rise of the department store, consumer culture, mass production. And then there's a line that I copied out in this little story, a pair of silk stockings. It had given her a feeling of assurance, a sense of belonging to the well-dressed multitude which means she doesn't want to be by herself. She buys these things to actually be part of life the way she sees life. And she was isolated before in her poverty and sort of just sort of sacrificing herself. Mm -hmm. So self-sacrifice was actually not the fulfillment, the wifely role, the angel in the house, something like that, but actually a sense of isolation. So she just wants to participate in life. And I think it's this part where we're having we haven't resolved it, as you said in the beginning of the conversation, we haven't resolved these things at all. I mean, today there's still, we have conversations every day about uh, women who have to do it all. They have to be mothers and uh, employees and successful CEOs or scientists or doctors. They also have to be wives. It's unusual for people to discuss that men have to be husbands and sort of not consider them yeah. role. Right? Yeah provide, right? We, 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 we're we comfortable saying they have to provide, which Leonce does, right? And and he's considered for that reason, he has acquitted himself 
perfectly in the eyes of the 19th century. But, you know, the uh, the important experiment I think that we get sort of in the awakening is, you know, you might ask, well, why can't she get what she wants, right? She seems perfectly poised to do it. And this is what confused people. It's like, okay, well, fine. She wants something different. Why the hell does she have to go into the ocean and kill herself at the end? People don't really, that, that seems to a lot of people um, really an unearned or over the top move on her part. But I think what is often left out of considerations of the book is the children, the children. And we have to think historically here. What do you think happens to children? Because you know, we're told over and over again, um, Madame Rantignol tells her at the very end, remember the children, remember the children. She herself even says, and she's talking to Dr. Mm -hmm. Mandalay uh, toward the end that, you know, I don't think anybody has the right to, um, uh, has any demands on anybody else, right? We don't have obligations she says, well, but except children, right? I don't wanna trample on the little lives. Think about what becomes of two little boys in late 19th century, high society uh, Creole milieu, whose mother is doing the things that she's doing. What happens to them? Destroys that, you know, do you, are, you, are you going to be someone, you know, who they're, they're gonna say your mother's a whore. It's not going to look good for you, right? If we've got this beautiful mother, and so she she realizes that there is absolutely no, given the conventions, given the way the society is constructed, there's absolutely no way for her to um, proceed ethically, right? Without trampling over other people and live the way that she wants to live. So you know this individualism that's been kind of offered as kind of paradigm by uh, lots of people for a long time, we see becomes completely uh, structurally unavailable to women for that reason. Well, it's interesting when you reread the ending in this way, she actually, because of course we also don't know, in the book just ends, that it's not just a selfish act, which probably no such act ever really is, but it opens up something. It feels really to me, and I don't know if I'm right, because you really sort of burst in this moment in American literary history, but she's really doing something unusual and something different from other people. And I think one of the reasons why the book is so interesting is because it doesn't settle these questions. And for some reason, 120 years later, we haven't settled them either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She, she wrote it, you know, we talked about the um, reception a little bit um, and it was just, uh, par for the course for people talking about it in the beginning to say, oh, everyone was just so scandalized. Oh, there were all these, all this sex and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you look at the reviews, however, from the time, you get a different picture. Yes, yeah, some of them um, are referring to the fact that, oh, yeah, this is kind of a um, uh, scandalous novel. I can't believe she wrote that, blah, blah, blah. But that really wasn't the uh, prevailing tenor, uh, it was really confusion. They were just perplexed. One reviewer uh, says, you know, you get, you read this and you think, qui bono? In other words, what's the use? What was the use? You know, they just, they, they were confused. You can hear it when you read this. And, that, you know, that's because Chopin was giving her society a picture of them that didn't make sense. This is how you are. And I think that the, that, that oh, the overwhelming perplexity that we see then and now is kind of paradoxically proof of her success. Right, right, that's interesting. I mean, Willa Cather has this famous review that you reference, where Willa Cather can be pretty, you know, catty in a way. She's like, why is she wasting her great talents on this subject matter? Other it, People have even done it, but, but she basically doesn't want this story to be, or this question to be posed. Willa Cather seems to say, why doesn't she just write a different kind of book, which is a funny thing to say to a novelist. And, and Willa you know, Cather's own strange attitude toward womanhood and female identity that she actually, so there, all this is a whole another conversation to be had, but she's posing a question to America. There's another little short story, Miss McGenders, which she basically, a young woman who is, 
upset about another woman's behavior and then someone says to her oh really you're so high and mighty to actually judge other people look how where your money came from mm -hmm. and she's totally stunned because it kind of pulls away the society societal norms that allow her to live her protected life as a woman so in some ways i think kate yeah. Chopin doesn't leave anybody really standing saying you can be so secure in your moral self-righteousness like there's no position that's totally safe it's true. And, you know, Cather's review is, to me, one of the um, biggest curiosities of that period of American uh, literary history for the fact that she would turn around and six years later publish a story that, you know, was at its core, The Awakening, by which I'm referring to this 1905 story she has called uh, Paul's Case, a study oh, in yeah. Have you, have you read oh, that? Yeah. Oh, he comes to New York, very strange. And there's a, is it, isn't it a snowy night or something? And there's a car, isn't there like, doesn't he walk around in New York at some point? Yes, he does, right? Um, okay. And, okay, good. I got the story at least in my head, yeah. It's, it's, it's this kind of early uh, entry into queer lit, really. It's included in uh, Chris Luby's most recent edition, or a volume of, of Amer 19th century American queer lit. Um, he's really like Edna in the sense that, you know, he's in this Midwestern society. I think it's maybe Indiana or something like somewhere. Um, right. uh, you know, uh, Cather was the, the the great documenter, early documenter of the Midwest when everybody's writing about these other places. Um, he doesn't fit in. He's, you know, to our eyes, it's pretty clear that, you know, she's writing a queer little boy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, he steals some money hitches a train and goes to New York. Um, and, you know, he's buying all of this stuff, um, you know, just really, really kind of in it. Uh, perhaps has this encounter with this undergraduate from Yale who's in town, right? They, they at the very least, have had a rager all night, you know, it's kind of left uh, up for us to um, deduce for ourselves what happened. But he too, just, there's this, undefined discontentment that is just driving him to one thing, uh, from one thing to the other. There's nothing uh, articulated as being wrong, but whatever he's going through, this feeling of alienation that's, uh, you know, that we see in Edna's case, it's so powerful that it leads him to jump in front of a train, right? right? You, the parallels are pretty obvious. There. And so, you know, it always confused me, uh, Catherine's review, when you know she would, she she clearly understood what uh, Chopin was after, and yet, and yet chose to treat it as another Bovary. She was the one, by the way, who introduced that comparison. Um, and this is not Emma Bovary. Edna Pontellier is not um, Emma Bovary. That's not what's going on here. Um, that's you know, I think. Uh, a facile connection that, uh, you know, I, I really, uh, I, I almost resent Cather for having brought that into the conversation because it just kept going and, and criticism for years and years and years. Oh, I, I think you're totally right. I think what's, what's interesting that I think Emma Bovary lives in sort of the cultural space as an inventive character, the way some people do. And so I think Edna Pontelier should have that same space for herself. It's not that she's a derivative or sort of a model or something, but she has such a space like Isabel Archer or somebody like that. So there are these people who become questions for us. Yeah. Like, like Jay Gatsby or someone like that, larger of these people who become so real to us because they leave something unresolved in us. I wonder, I wanna, Raphael, I wanna ask you a question at the end, which is really maybe easy, maybe difficult, I don't know. So we are two, men or male identified people, critics or readers talking about a book written by a woman about a woman, which also has been really, um, was rediscovered by, I think both male and female critics, but really has been enlisted and read and really brought back into prominence by a lot of women who had to fight really hard to actually get women's literature, meaning written by women, even accepted. Mm -hmm. So let's just acknowledge that it wasn't really a canonized and widely read. And one of the simple reasons is because almost no books by women were in the canon at all until 
really recently. So how do you, when you teach the book or when you talk about it, and people probably respond to this book differently depending on how they identify, I assume that, right? So how do you um, address this? And it's just, a, it, it's just a question that everybody always has. I have this question, like I read this book, I was deeply moved by this book and I'm thinking, wait, why am I moved? What am I identifying with? I don't have the situation. I'm, <laughs> what parts are in me, what parts are in her? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. I think it's really, really timely because I, I think what we're going to find, because, uh, you know, right now we are really, really, um, our moment is really interested in talking about intersectionality. And I think that's a very, very good thing. And, you know, protagonists like Edna Pontellier, um, I mean, you see this actually, um, if you, you probably remember uh, Toni Morrison's preface to Beloved. Um, she talks about kind of what makes her write about uh, this uh, enslaved woman who who killed her children, right? Based on a true story, Margaret um, uh, Margaret um, Margaret Garner, right? Margaret Garner, um, and she says, you know, I, I I'm living in the '80s, right? And I'm seeing right now all of this uh, kind of Betty Friedan <laughs> Betty Friedan style feminism, where people are complaining about women are wanting equal pay, more access to education, and so forth. And then she's moved to think about, um, you know, a, a group of people who were made to give birth, but couldn't even be mothers, right? And, and you've got these women who are complaining about motherhood. So, you know, for a long time, what we've seen happening is just this impatience in culture for um, relatively privileged people to kind of have the spotlight and complain when there are so many other people whose lot is, is far worse. I think that uh, wedge is going to continue to be um, a problem uh, for readers of, of The Awakening. I think it's a good thing uh, in many ways, um, but we do have to remember that it's not a zero sum game. Just because there are people below or who have it worse doesn't mean that um, these people had it bad. Um, and, you know, there, there's one sense in which, you know, we, we want to read it politically, right? It is a book about feminism. But there's that other sense where it has to be treated as kind of a human problem, right? It, it is a human problem. Uh, in the sense, you know, what do we think about the possibilities for selfhood when you live in a world that doesn't really afford those, um, right? We can extend that uh, mutatis mutandis to different uh, groups uh, throughout. And I, I think about my own identification with it, right? And I'm using a bad uh, scholarly word here in invoking identification, I know. But it, was, it required that kind of, um, uh, I guess, uh, flexibility in thinking about it. No, we're not exactly the same, but I can understand this problem, right? This is a problem that would afflict any of us, uh, you know, who are told that we should be doing something or told that our society prizes this one thing and we're not permitted the conditions that afford our doing it, right? Thinking about structural yeah. um, differences that, you know, we can extrapolate beyond that. Um, I think if we want, we have to be careful, of course, but. Yeah, yeah, that's a great answer. I, I was, I think, um, as you said, that it's probably good for everybody to think about what we're told to do. And some of a book allows you to see that for a character. And it's not, it doesn't always exactly mirror one's own experience, but it opens up the space to think and not take things for granted. Um, mm -hmm. The two other stories you said for our listeners, um, so The Awakening is a relatively short novel compared to some other novels. So it's, you know, it's clocks in at a few pages than any Edith Wharton or things like that. It's, more, it's even short. So the story of an hour is a very famous one. I think yeah. that's the one people should probably look at, right? A pair of silk stockings. Um, yep. And then the one that's very famous, Toddler Desiree's Baby. But I think the story of an hour contains so much. And I think the one thing it also contains is this kind of irony or humor, which is really lost in some ways sometimes, right? I mean. <laughs> yeah, that you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Like Kate Chopin was funny. And right. you know, yeah. a lot, 
the way that we're conditioned to approach classics is yeah. solemnly, right? We approach them so solemnly that, right. you know, we really lose some of the humor uh, that's that's supposed to to be there. I think there's something in in the awakening, the way she deals with these two younger men who in the beginning of the book, I thought they were much younger and they're not much younger at all because she's barely 30. So in some ways they make, they make it sound, which is also interesting. And the woman, as soon as she's married, she is beyond any youth. Yeah. She goes from youth to just this permanence of not having no desires anymore at all. But I think but, she's quite funny with the suitors. Yeah. Like, I mean, it also shows you just how immature they were, which, you know, kind of undercuts further, you know, this, um, uh, this, this wish to make them seem these great loves of hers. I mean, once you see how unheroic someone like Robert Lebrun is, uh, you come to think, uh, well... Yeah, I have been I have been a hundred percent guilty of this kind of fantasy that actually, like, the immaturity, I'm so in that that I always... I always see like so much, so much of possibility and potential when it may not be. I don't think it's about real being realistic in those moments when you're falling in love. Who cares? Like, what do you want? Do you want it to be like realistic or something at this moment? Well, yeah, like, you know, you just you kind of um, you think of that moment toward the end where he's insisting that um, she, um, you know, we can only be together. You know, I'll go to Leonce and say you know, this is what's going on. And uh, effectively, he can give you to me. And she laughs in his face because it's so clear to her that he doesn't get it. She says, if you were to go to Leon and say, here, take her, I wouldn't go to you. You're missing what this is. So it's so clear that by the end, he doesn't even get it. Even he is trying to fit their relationship into this conventional thing that she's trying to get away from. Uh, yes, you know, um, uh, leaving someone for someone else, that is unconventional. But all you're doing is moving from one conventional relationship to another, right? The same right. rules uh, are going. What, what you just said, it makes me think, actually, I just understood something, I think, from your comment. I think he falls for her because she is changing herself. and. Then he misunderstands, says, I want you. And he's, she says, no, what you see in me is this change and this potential. And she yes, says, it's hard to know. Uh, but, you know, he does wax pretty competitive uh, <laughs> when he finds out that there's another uh, you know, cock in the pen, so to speak, with uh, Alfred Arobin, uh, the um, uh, big womanizer uh, on the scene. Um, you know, he, he comes in and almost as if, he were her husband. Oh, you've been hanging out with Alcid, right? Um, so it, it's just very, very clear that he's kind of replaying a lot of these things that she's actually, you know, trying to get out of the whole time. Uh, and then it becomes, okay, he's clearly not going to be the vehicle to help me get where I need to be. I give up on this, right? And this just all seems like uh, an abortive thing. Right, right, right. Huh. I'm going to look at those scenes again. Yeah, yeah. I sort of, I'm, I'm, I confess, I'm sort of, I'm, I get so confused in these situations that <laughs> I would believe all of his profession of love. And so I'm, I'm sort of, I, when I read that, I was completely exactly not sure. And she's more mature than I am. I would have said, oh, okay, that's great. Thank you. Tell me more. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, it's a book I've been reading almost annually for the last 15 years. So, you know, um, it, it's because she's just so oblique and, and uh, you know, um, uh, suggestive rather than explicit. And it's one of the things that makes her able to jam so much uh, into such a short novel. And also one of the reasons that led to her, uh, you know, um, being misunderstood for so long. She, Chopin is just so subtle and suggestive rather than uh, explicit. Um, and so, you know, it makes, you will, I, I promise you, you will find something every time you, you return to it. It's a gift that just keeps on giving. A seasonable thing to say right now. Yeah, actually I'm kind of moved to say like for us, I think it's nice that we're talking about her book 120 years later that she was really not 
misunderstood. She actually pretty much lost her career after this novel was published. So like maybe not quite as starkly as people yeah. thought, but she didn't publish as much anymore. So there was a p price she paid. Well, you know, she died five years later. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there, there was that yet another one of uh, our, our brilliant uh, writers who died way too early. She was only in her fifties um, when she when she died. It's uh, actually kind of a kind of a freak um, uh, accident, right? She has this hemorrhage uh, right. right after leaving the World's Fair, um, which is, you know, maybe she didn't. I'm being flippant here, but maybe she disliked the spectacle of it all so much. As, uh, you know. um, but but yeah, she, you know, I tend not to believe, based on what I've seen, that she was as crestfallen mm -hmm. as a lot of people have, have painted her as being. Because, mm -hmm. again, she was someone who had this, she didn't take herself too seriously. I think she knew very well what was going to happen when she put this out? Yeah. I, I don't think she would have. She wouldn't have had a, a occasion to write it if mm -hmm. people understood themselves this yeah. well. I, I think she kind of had to expect that it wouldn't be met with uh, with with tons of approval, right? And it was never banned. I mean, that was something that people uh, when we were first. When it was first being rescued uh, from obscurity, people liked to tell the myth that was put out. It was never banned. People were just confused by it, just kind of went out of circulation, went out of print. And then, you know, if things aren't talked about anymore and things aren't being reprinted. Right. You know, the publishing industry goes on. People keep reading other things. Uh, and, you know, it just kind of languished uh, there until Kenneth Ebel um, came in the 60s and, uh, you know, found that book again. And then, uh, you know, a little ironically, but uh, not quite when you think about the connection, Per Seierstead uh, becomes her big rescuer. But it turns out Per Seierstead, you know, the, the Norwegian thing is kind of like not intuitive. But when you realize that he was the student of her French translator, who was in France, uh, it begins to make a bit more sense why, why you know, uh, that, that connection between, between them. But, you know, she, she was having, she, she was uh, received better by the later generations abroad than she had been here. She wouldn't have been the first, that was true for Edgar Allan Poe. Um, you know, he much, much more, um, celebrated by uh, European writers, particularly for you. Know, Baudelaire loved him. Baudelaire was his translator. That's not uh, unprecedented uh, at all, though. It's I, I can't think of too many other women uh, for whom that had been uh, the case, at least that early uh, in in our history. So. Interesting. So, Raphael, I want to thank you for making me reread *The Awakening*, and I'm really happy that you're going to write an introduction to a new edition. I think the book, I have a wonderful Signet Classics edition that's totally beaten up from, I don't know when, and it's really wonderful, but it's also a relic from the early 80s or something like that. I don't know when it was, actually 1976. So I think it's good to give it a different kind of take. Um, and uh, I want to point out to our listeners or viewers that, again, you are on Twitter as uh, RAF, underscore walk so for Raphael walker the think about it podcast you can find it on youtube it's ulrich bear on my channel um, it makes a big difference if people subscribe because it means other people can find it much more easily we're also on instagram as the think about it podcast and the book you're going to publish with warbler press people can find warbler press on instagram or on the web um, it's going to come out sometime so uh, Thank you so much, and then I really hope to have you back on the on the show for uh, for other uh, things you've written about. So I'm really, I just I'm thrilled to have this conversation. I hope to be back. This has been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Think about it. Deep conversations with Uli Bear on big ideas and great books.